2024 is the 1500th anniversary of the death of Boethius, a scholar in his own day and known now for the consolation of philosophy. It asks a key question, one still pressing now, which is how can lasting, true, utterly reliable happiness be found? It was a medieval bestseller, massively influential on all sorts of subsequent philosophers and theologians and poets. It's also very readable as a dialogue with poems and arguments and outpourings of lament and praise as well. So what do Boethius, and in particular Lady Philosophy, who appears to him to reveal the truth, what do they tell us? So first of all, a little bit about, about Boethius himself. He was born an aristocrat in the final decades of the 5th century. So he lived in Ravenna when that was the capital of the Western Empire. And it is therefore a time of immense turbulence and change. In the 480s, he saw the fall of the last Roman emperor and in the mix of that complex politics is also very complex religiosity. Um, Christianity has become the religion of the empire, but Arianism, now thought of as a heresy, was often in the ascendancy during Boethius's time. So it was very easy to find yourself on the wrong side of the argument, which he did, in fact. His family had become Christian following the conversion of Constantine, and when his father died, he was adopted into a leading Roman family, as well as marrying into that family subsequently. And his career blossomed as a result. He became a senator and a consul, partly due to that position, but also because he was clearly immensely able and literary. But of course, he also therefore inevitably made enemies in the court. And eventually this catches up with him and he is sentenced to death which he doesn't lament only because of the curtailment of his life, but because he sees it as a massive betrayal, a betrayal of friends become enemies, but also a betrayal of life itself. He had striven to do good, and yet it had led him to this terrible end. And that is the first motivation for him writing The Consolation of Philosophy, how to understand that terrible predicament he was probably in prison for a while in Pavia and executed in 524, possibly on October the 23rd. And the story is that he might well have been expecting a pretty horrific end whilst imprisonment, twisted with cords around his neck until his eyes bulged and then clubbed to death. Although it's also possible he might have been executed by a sword thrust. But nonetheless, he has some time in prison, at least that's how he presents it in The Consolation of Philosophy, to consider all these things. And it starts out with him immensely depressed, lying in bed, not being able to move because of where fate or fortune has seemingly brought him. And the work begins there, but takes him to a very, very different place, a readiness, in fact, for death but it involves a lot of twists and turns, a lot of argument and struggle on his part, and a vision, a dialogue with Lady Philosophy. I think he probably did have some kind of vision. Um, I don't see how he could have found himself out of his predicament and depression by reason alone. And in fact, that's one of the things that Lady Philosophy tells him, is you can't reason yourself out of these things. You need to be able to receive something as well. But no doubt... The vision he had was amplified by his literary skills into the form which we have now. He cries out to heaven, therefore, at the beginning about how the unjust triumph over the just. And this is a repeated theme. It returns many times, never once wholly answered. And yet a different alternative perspective gradually comes clear to him as he returns to his distress. And maybe this is a key part of the consolation of philosophy that is being by, by being honest about our distress that the truth gradually reveals itself to us. How can this be? 
it's a kind of problem of evil, if you like, um, which is partly why the text still speaks to us today. It also deals with things like free will, with things like determinism, with things like the nature of the good, the nature of the cosmos itself. So there's a lot packed in. But Lady Philosophy is his guide, and she comes to him with two kinds of medicine. She's going to try what she calls a gentle remedy at first, and then a stronger potion when, as it turns out, that doesn't work. But we might ask, first of all, you know, why philosophy? Um, why not inspiration? Um, why not revelation? Um, why not logic? And the truth is, Bothius tells us that inspiration can't wholly be trusted because whilst it lifts us when we're happy, it drags us down when we're sad. The muses, he says, the sources of inspiration are like an amplifier. They amplify the emotion of the moment, you know, like a drug does. But if the emotion of the moment is devilish, then that's what seems to be the only truth. And so can't heal the soul. Um, the muses, the drug might lacerate us like a bad trip, as well as lift us up like in ecstasy. But he wants something deeper. He needs something deeper. And that's another key dynamic in the consolation of philosophy. How can we move through these surface transient experiences and discover something more lasting? Similarly, one shouldn't rely on fortune, as if he might wait for the good times to return. Or maybe trying to calculate that the good on the whole outweighs the bad. Um, but fortune is going to play a role, in fact, um, but not in the way that he initially presumes. So he needs Sophia, he needs Lady Philosophy, and this can ground him in his life. It can give him insights about the nature of the cosmos from a transcendent as well as an immediate perspective. The immediate and the transcendent, it turns out, are not two different things, but one can lead to the other. Lady Philosophy appears and says that she has a ladder which is connected to the ground, full of practical insight, but also leads up to what's called theoretical philosophy. That's not abstract or inferred, but it's about a kind of contemplation, about a dwelling in divine things. And both ends of the ladder are needed, the grounded as well as the theoretical. Lady Philosophy tells Boethius not to take one bit and think he's got the whole. He needs the whole of his life in order to understand the whole of the true nature of the cosmos. So first of all, she tries the weaker kind of medicine. Um, this is a medicine that doesn't indulge the poisons of the life, doesn't indulge the emotions or different kinds of inspiration. Um, but points to something deeper. He at first incidentally doesn't recognise lady philosophy as philosophy. And I think this is saying that he's got also to let go of his education to that point, his rationalising, his analysing, his summing up, his seeming wisdom, because it's not real wisdom, which is actually a kind of direct awareness of the source of wisdom. It's an intuition about where all logic might come from and identifying with that source rather than with the logic itself. This contact with wisdom is what he must learn. And though it only really comes through suffering, realising the limits of what he had thought he possessed or owned or understood. And that's often why true wisdom is avoided because it only comes with suffering that leads to a kind of letting go. She says that he's been looking in the dust when he must orientate himself to the stars as well. He needs to learn to look up and to look in, not just look at, um, as adversity had caused him to do. Uh, but she also says that he has actually only just forgotten the truths that she will teach him. And when he sees them again, he'll realise that he's actually remembering what he had forgotten. It seems to a Boethius that he's in a very dark night indeed, one that might never end, when in reality, Lady Philosophy tells him, it's the clouds that have obscured the sky. And it's he who has deserted her, not she him. He's made his predicament into a prison, when actually, she very surprisingly tells him at this juncture, that his prison could actually be a citadel. It could be a fortress from which he could withstand 
whatever fortune might throw at him. And this is how he needs to learn to look again at fortune, not to be moved by it, but to become immovable in the face of it. He's banished himself from happiness. Lady philosophy says no one else could have done it. So this is the gentle medicine that is challenging Boethius to think again. And which sets up, of course, the intrigue for we readers. How do we forget our real home? And how do we know how to find it again? The root, Lady Philosophy tells Boethius, and so therefore tells us, is through the seat of our mind, the seat of our mind, but how to find that. An early lesson as part of the gentle remedy for Boethius is that he has mistaken happenstance for a more profound ordering of the cosmos. And so he can't see that deeper truth, being confused with that, that, confusing that which is transient with that which is eternal. But that said, the ordering of things does contain a seed of truth about the, the way that the cosmos actually is. And Lady Philosophy can use that, can grow it within him. The difficulty is that happenstance or fortune, transience, is bound up with time. It's not quite a random godos, goddess, um, fortuna, Lady Philosophy tells him. But the trick is to recognise fortuna's changeability and not be attached to it. Interestingly, fortuna's feast day, the 24th of June, is the same as John the Baptist's. And in the Christian tradition, of course, the Baptist is a herald to something more, to Christ, that which is coming. And so fortune, the ups and downs of life, might also be known by us as a kind of herald, not to cling to, but in order to listen to, and so see something more. And then what fortune therefore presages through its changeability might come to be a source of peace, a kind of guide to a calm centre, when the changeability itself is relativized. And that which prompts or change can come to be known. Lady Philosophy tries to persuade Boethius out of his depression with these early arguments. He's had a good life. Can he see the goodness within the details of his good life? Can his blessings indicate that there's a source to all blessing? Can he identify with that source rather than what he had and has now lost? She's trying out what he understands in a way and, and sees where she might contact him and so guide him to more. But at least at first, he can't get this. He's too overwhelmed, both by what he's lost, by his sense of betrayal, um, by his lament, and of course, by his fear for what might happen to his, him next. The problem is that he can't let go of regarding what he has as his own possessions rather than as indicators of more. Um, all luck is good luck who bears it with equanimity, she tries to tell him, but equanimity eludes him at the moment. She says that complete happiness hinges upon possessing oneself, not possessing other things. And yet he doesn't really know who he is. He's forgotten his divine nature and so can't hold on to himself and so tries to possess other things as a result. Lady Philosophy tries to tell him that there are two kinds of happiness. In the Latin there's Felix, um, which is a kind of transient happiness, and then there's Beatitude, which is a lasting and unconditional happiness, but at the moment he only knows the former. So the weaker medicine is not working and she turns to the stronger remedy. What makes you rich? is not that which is transient, she tells him, but that which can be shared without diminution. Material goods don't offer that because they possess you as much as you possess them and they either deteriorate or are stolen or lose their value or just don't deliver what they promise. And the stronger medicine within this fairly self-evident truth when you think about it is that therefore we actually own nothing but if we can recognise that actually we own nothing, that opens the door to knowing everything when we become that our nature, therefore, is with that which is within all the things that we did know. So again, this disidentification with our possessions and re-identification with that 
from which all things, including those that we temporarily possess, come from. Bo Boethius needs to understand, to develop an inner understanding of outer things. He needs a cosmic point of view, not the earthly one. He needs an interior perspective, not merely a surface view. The point within a point, as Lady Philosophy tells him, relativizing his mundane um, perspectives. So for example, earthly fame, even if you're famous for being virtuous or for serving the community, as Boethius indeed thought that he did, it might bring a kind of immortality on earth, but Lady Philosophy tells him it will count for absolutely nothing. All that depends upon what other mortals make of you risks losing the source of true immortality, confusing that which is bestowed by other human beings with that which is bestowed by God. What gets lost in the pursuit of fame, therefore, is also the voice of conscious conscience. What can also get lost in the pursuit of fame, even good fame, is the voice of conscience, that inner path, that inner discernment towards God, which has that as its goal, not even doing good things. Look whence you came and see who made you. God, Lady Philosophy, tells him in one of the poems at the end of this section. She explains that bad fortune therefore can elicit this source too because it shows fortune's true nature. It comes and goes, it passes. And so she's starting to try and show him that his bad fortune, terrible though uh, undoubtedly is, is in fact a blessing in disguise. That is the stronger medicine he must come to grips with. What it might prompt is a contemplation of the kind of happiness that ends all desires. That might be called the presence of the good itself, not just good things. That is a power not to do or to achieve or persecute others, of course, but also is a power, but rather is a power to receive and to share. All things seek this power, Lady Philosophy tells them, as it's the source of their life. But human beings get very confused about this and can do very bad and wrong things about it, seeking to own the power for themselves as much as any possessions or fame. Take money, um, for example, and they consider a number of different examples in the dialogue. They think about pleasure, they think about power, and they think about glory, um, but take money or wealth. Lady Philosophy explains to him that it's a false god because it's a misdirected yearning for God. It promises to bring satisfaction, but can't bring the infinite satisfaction human beings really seek, and so ties you to itself, as you always need more money to get the happiness which the money you have has already promised. It's a kind of vicious spiral. So it's not that money is bad in itself. It's bad when you become tied to it as the deliverer of your happiness. It's okay when it speaks to wider values, a wider wealth. And so you can be light with the money because it's given you a taste of this deeper wealth and you're really interested in that deeper wealth as a result. A way of putting this is to think about the inner beauty of life, she tells him. It's another key clue. Money in itself has no inner beauty, but what money can do might have an inner beauty. So we can look at wealth and we can look at power and honour and glory and pleasure and detect that inner quality, that inner perspective, and see that therefore they're reflections of divine wealth, divine power, divine honour, divine glory. It's very interesting that these words can be used in both perspectives and that is a key clue. They really belong to God but we take them and turn them into mundane attributes and then think that is the goal. The test is whether you can let go of your earthly wealth, power, honour, glory and pleasure and so on. And if you can, then you're not beholden to fortune, but are starting to learn from fortune of these deeper things. When the wheel of fortune turns, therefore, you might even start to see it as an opportunity to deepen your sense of life. 
And Boethius by now is beginning to get a sense of that as well. His doubt even has a kind of inner beauty, his struggle, his suffering, because it brings out his vulnerability. And that is the beginnings of an openness to much more than he had presumed. You might say that what's beginning to be revealed to Boethius is a different vision of the cosmos. And they discuss this more metaphysical notion as well. Um, Lady Philosophy explains to him that there's a world soul, and that's a bridge between spirit and matter. Or she says that there's a centre around which everything else revolves. There are a number of metaphors, and Lady Philosophy says that by contemplating these metaphors, the mind can scan and can become aware around the edges of what it's scanning, of a deeper truth. Um, and this is what philosophy would try to convey. It's a participative kind of knowledge about what's good and realising about what false goods don't offer. And that participative knowledge, therefore, becomes a kind of path that he can follow. He knows it in his heart as well as in his mind. He knows it through what's bad as well as what's good. The path itself is not conditional upon his life, but through that which is conditioned in his life leads to that which reveals itself to be unconditioned. Lady Philosophy puts it like this, she says, whoever wants shall see this shining light, the true light, will say the sun's own rays are not so bright. So even a lovely thing like the sun's own rays are seen as just a, a faint echo of that which is the true source of light. Another dynamic to become more aware of is that all things seek to return to the good from whence they came. Even if they're mistaken in their seeking, thoughts circle home. And the notion of encircling and spiralling up rather than falling down becomes a key dynamic that they try to explore. The turning of the wheel of fortune is part of that return even. And in fact, at this point, it starts to become clear that the goddess Fortuna is not really turning the wheel of fortune of her own volition as if she were a random goddess, but she too is in the service of the divine source. And so in a way, God is turning the wheel of fortune. Living and dying even become part of moving towards that which is truly living, seeing all things in the round and looking towards that which lies behind and within them starts to become a bit more possible for Boethius. Lady Philosophy says, there is nothing that can preserve its own nature and go against God. In other words, our own nature is with God. And when we do go against our true nature, which is to say against God, we find ourselves in trouble. We find ourselves in hell. But if we can detect the love that's the energy, the spirit that's moving, the ordering power within that which is transient and the love which is operative within ourselves. That love which gives without reserve is happy without requiring this or that. We're beginning to find our path towards the consolation that philosophy is offering. Beware though, Lady Philosophy tells him to, at this relatively advanced stage, of thinking you've got it. The old passions will inevitably return when you think you've got it. Even if you're in the underworld, she says, that must be seen as a good place to be, quite as good as in the heavens. Whatever happens can be accepted when you truly know about these matters, because happiness doesn't depend on what is happening, but on the light that what is happening reveals from within it. Through anything that's transient can be detected eternity. Freedom and will are another key theme that draw out this deeper truth. More freedom and greater power of will come when they are both aligned to the divine freedom and will. So paradoxically, we're most free, most exercising our free will when we're aligned with the source of freedom, the source of that, the source of that which wills, which from a mundane perspective might be seen as a loss of freedom and a loss of will. But if they're both, as it were, maxed out, they don't fight 
the wider order, but they align are in service of the wider order, which after all is the completion of freedom, is the completion of God who wills all things into being. Finding that kind of freedom during our earthly lives is really only possible, Lady Philosophy explains, in moments of contemplation, when we turn in on ourselves and are aware of that from which all things spring, we find quite a lot of freedom when attempting to incarnate that divine dynamic on earth. We start to lose it when becoming to when becoming bound to um, the things of this life, and we pervert it, and in fact are losing our freedom when we become enslaved to vices and passions, which prevent us from seeing what's good and so also prevent us from seeing what we really want and therefore becoming a kind of prison you know rather than a citadel. Evil therefore another key theme they discuss is actually a loss of humanity and in fact Lady Philosophy says it's it's actually weak because it's really based on ignorance. It also lacks self-control and therefore is a kind of enslavement and then at worst Um, It's consciously and perversely wedded to what's bad, even if the deep intuition is that it is bad because of an inability inability to do anything else. But Lady Philosophy says, you know, we should pity those who do evil. Um, And in fact, this is one of the moments where Christ is present implicitly in the consolation of philosophy. It's sometimes remarked that though it's a Christian text, it doesn't mention Christ, but I think part of the motivation there is to start to see Christ emerging from within the wisdom that Lady Philosophy is communicating. And when the wisdom seems most radical, that's when Christ becomes most clearly the unspoken presence in the book. So wishing well for those who do evil, of course, those who have done evil to Boethius, is a Christic moment. So the truth is that true knowledge liberates us. And this is what Lady Philosophy brings. It's not dependent upon inspiration or mood. Um, And we may have to renew our awareness of the good, you know, even moment by moment. But a test is the feeling that in so doing, we are freer. We realise we're not tied to pleasure or success, but are free to leave those things behind in order to dwell, to contemplate a deeper, quieter joy. Lady Philosophy says we discover our true nature when we realise that we aren't self-sufficient, but that's okay because there is an unconditional source of our being. We must understand ourselves as like a cosmos turning around a still centre, she says, and all that turns in our lives, all that moves, all that comes and goes, is orbiting around that origin. And so in the very movement, in the very coming and going, we know of that dynamism, and therefore in that dynamism is a sign of the wellspring. We can glimpse this, she says, as if from the corner of our finite minds, but recognising it as a glimpse of the infinite. She calls it a boundless immediacy, because it's at once beyond us and really beyond our articulation, though it's also closer to us than our own comprehension, because it's the source of any comprehension we might have. I might say that our consciousness is a sharing in the divine consciousness. Everything is present to God, would be another way of putting it, even though we maybe are mostly aware of the coming and going. So don't try and arrest the present to possess it in the things that we have or don't have, but embrace the flow and detect within that flow the source of the flow. This, of course, reminds me of William Blake very much. He who binds to himself the joy does the winged life destroy. He who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise. Kissing the joy as it flies is actually to selflessly know the origin of that which is flying and therefore to be aware of eternity's sunrise and be able to let that which flies fly. 
A false good, though, is an attempt to hold on to it, to bind to yourself the joy, not rejoice in the goodness. Boethius, even quite a long way into the consolation of philosophy, does keep asking his original question about why evil people seem to get the last laugh. But as he returns to it each time, you realise that his orientation is shifting, in fact. It's widening, it's expanding, and keeping at the niggle, still staying with the suffering that he still is feeling, is actually leading into a kind of deeper rationality, not of success or power or fortune or argument, but of divine providence. An understanding that is not so much based on reasoning, but upon this direct wisdom or insight. That which doesn't move or shift can be detected in all that moves and shifts. Another set of rather lovely images um, is that providence can be thought of like the landscape that guides the river to the ocean. The chance turns of the river, the seeming randomness of the current, is actually an effect of this wider holding. And you might also say that the landscape witnesses the twists and turns of the river without ever letting it go. And God is the same with us. When we feel the moment of despair because of what life throws at us, we become reliant upon our self-sufficiency and are aware that it doesn't work. But instead, the twists and turns can be known as part of this wider landscape, once again, that's holding all things, even when the river flails around. This holding, this outpouring from that which doesn't let us go, like the landscape in the river or like the still centre around which everything revolves, is another intimation of Christ in the consolation of philosophy. And we can know that love when we return that love with love. This is the primary mode of participation because it echoes the dynamic from which all things spring. We participate in the true dynamic of life and find the consolation of philosophy when returning that love with love, when returning that good with what we have that's good, when returning our partial knowledge and gaining a glimpse of the knowledge that is beyond all that we can fully understand because then our knowledge is known as just an echo, a reflection of God's knowledge. We live in the sight of God who sees all things, Lady Philosophy tells Boethius. And that participation, that continual reorientating, that reflecting on what happens to us, not so as to try and secure our lives, but to become more and more aware of the source of our lives, which is unconditional, which can never let us go, which remains in spite of all that happens, and through that which happens can be known, is the consolation of philosophy. It's a life's work, but that's what our life is about. So it's also the truth of our lives. And the consolation of philosophy ends with Boethius getting it. He has tracked his suffering, stayed with it, been honest to it, but also seen how there's more than it. And through receiving the wisdom of Lady Philosophy, taking those moments when he can glimpse more than that which is preoccupying, even that which seems at the beginning to grip him wholly through the weak medicine that Lady Philosophy tries at first, and then the stronger medicine that really is what he needs because his own struggles are not serving him well, it shows him an unconditional, a true, a lasting happiness, which one hopes, as we remember him 1500 years on, did indeed provide him with consolation as he faced his execution and can still speak to us and to others 1500 years on.